happy Memorial Day, everyone. This is Elsie Kearns, Wellness with Elsie, and your Chaos to Clarity coach, Eden Energy Medicine practitioner. And we're going to do this a second time because we had a great interview with Richard Bell. We kind of lost it a little bit in the ether. So we're back again. And I'm delighted to have Richard with me today because he is a photo journalist. And I wanted him to talk about his book, The Last Veterans of World War II. He's done a beautiful black and white photo book. And what a day to honor our veterans. So Richard, welcome. And can you tell me a little bit about how you were able to track these people down? Because this seemed to be quite a difficult thing to do considering privacy laws and everything else. Uh, yes, that's exactly right. The um, uh, no, Nobody keeps an official list of the, the World War II veterans, and uh, <clears throat> but some organizations do, but they're not allowed to disclose who they have on their list. So um, the primary way I tracked down uh, the 45 veterans who are in my book, and at this point I'm going to shamelessly hold a copy of my book up. Great. Uh, I hope the light's hitting it. Yes, I can see it. It looks great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when I conceived the book, I conceived uh, a, a book that would cover the diversity of the, the World War II effort. You know, it, it was a real collective effort. It was men, women, uh, every walk of life, you name it. Uh, everybody pitched in. So I wanted a book of veterans who reflected that. So I had to go all around the country to find them. So I, I knew who I wanted as far as, you know, I needed people who had been in the Marines in the South Pacific. I needed uh, different categories. There were a lot of big events in the war, D-Day, uh, the Bataan Death March. There were Navajo code talkers. There were Japanese Americans. There were African Americans. And I needed to track them down. Uh, so the main technique I used was jumping on the internet and going around. Uh, I, I knew some names, so I would type in a name to see if anybody else had written about them. And sure enough, I'd find a small town newspaper that did a story about their local hero. And uh, that well, of course, I, I, that told me where they lived, and now I needed their phone number or an introduction. And then I'd call the little newspaper and ask to talk to the reporter who did the story. Um, and that's how I found uh, many of the, what ended up being 45 veterans, because my deadline came before I got all 50 in the book. Um, and that was the primary way. The second way was... Um, Whenever I photographed a veteran, when we were done, I'd say, so, uh, do you know, well, here's a story to illustrate that. <clears throat> so I'm down at the Supreme Court photographing uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Stevens. And I'm in Washington in his office. He still goes to the office. He is retired, but at 96, he shows up every day in his suit at the Supreme Court. So he was a good guy. He told me a great, a great story, which... I'm gonna direct you to my book to, to read the great story about the Chicago Cubs. But at the end of our session, I said, so uh, judge, do you know any other veterans who you think I might uh, try to get in my book? And uh, Justice Stevens looked at me and said, yeah, you should get President Bush. He is a real hero. Uh, <laughs> to which I said, that's a great idea. Uh, would you call him for me? And Stevens goes, no, that's what you're good at. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I took his advice and I did get to President Bush, mainly because I dropped Judge Stevens' name. I said, uh, dear President Bush, so I was in Judge Stevens' office the other day and he said I ought to call you. So mm -hmm. that's all it took to get President Bush. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I wasn't able to, we weren't able to complete the, uh, the photo shoot or the interview because he was, got sick and had to go to the hospital. So 
he's missing from the book. But that's the other way. So those are the two ways I track down everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember one story that you kind of had a stroke of luck when you were with the Navajo code talker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, who I went out and photographed in the Navajo Nation. Uh, and after the after we had interviewed and taken our pictures, we went out to lunch together. He's a really friendly guy. He drove me in his pickup truck. He's 93. Still wears cowboy boots and blue jeans and you know, he doesn't look any different. He, he looks as, as vital as anybody. So we're eating lunch, and I say, so, Roy, uh, you know anybody who ought to be in my book? And he goes, he thinks, and he goes, oh, yeah, you ought to get Hiroshi. And I'm like, Hiroshi? And he goes, yeah, Hiroshi, Hiroshi Miyamura. He won the Medal of Honor. And I'm like, first I fall out of my chair on the floor. Then I get up, and I go, you got to be kidding me. There's a Japanese American Medal of Honor winner right here in this neighborhood. And he goes, sure. You want me to call him? And I said, yeah, call him. <laughs> so sure. Roy takes his cell phone out of his pocket, 93 years old. Boom, boom, boom. Hey, Hiroshi, this is Roy. I got a guy here who's doing a book about veterans. Uh, do you want to be in his book? You do? Okay, I'll give him your address. Bye. Boom. Next thing I know, I'm with Hiroshi Miyamura, Medal of Honor winner, 93 years old, Japanese American. So. <laughs> oh, that's amazing that he's still alive because you were saying earlier that a lot of the Medal of Honor winners were gone, were not alive, or got that after because they had died saving other lives. It's the most common. You usually have to get killed to get the Medal of Honor. And I, I don't say that facetiously, but I, I, I don't know the actual statistics, but I got to believe half of the recipients were killed doing this heroic deed that's, you know, saved, saved their entire company or whatever they did. They did something really on, uh, beyond the call of duty. Um, yeah. In the case of Hiroshi, they, you know, when they gave it to him, they could have thought he was dead because he, he killed between 60 and 80 Chinese soldiers hand-to-hand -hand combat and then spent three years in a prison camp in North Korea. Mm. I'm not okay. sure that, yeah, so uh, they found him at the end of the war, I guess. <laughs> and, yeah, he had gotten the Medal of Honor. Mm. Yeah, now I, I should clarify, because some people might be going to say, wait a second, Hiroshi was in World War II in Italy. He got the Medal of Honor in Korea, because being the patriotic guy he is, they called him up and they said, will you do it again? And he said, yeah, and he went to Korea. So okay. he got his Medal of Honor in Korea, but he was in World War II in Italy. In the 442nd all Nisai Regiment. They put all the Japanese Americans together, just like they did the uh, uh, African Americans. Yeah, they fought in their own division, their own regiment. And I know there was a special lady that you got to interview who had been a nurse. If you have her picture, you can put it up on the screen. I think you said she's 97 at well, this point. She passed this past year. Okay. Ninety six, and um, mm -hmm. I always like to, when I spoke of the diversity in the beginning of this interview, I did say ladies. So, I, you know, I always make a point. It was everybody, and um, not many of the ladies went overseas. They only let nurses. They had a lot of stateside women in the in the armed forces who did stateside duty. Some of them went overseas, and uh, Genevieve. This is Genevieve. Great photo, yeah. Genevieve Smith was a nurse, and she saw action in uh, in Africa, in Italy, and France. Um, and she has some very harrowing stories to tell. Uh, and she was a very gracious lady, and I met with her. 
Um, I tracked her down through a, a story in the Sarasota Herald, uh, and uh, I met with her. And oh, I I, I want to show this picture of, of her. Um, this is her with a couple of her patients. Is that close enough? Yes. And you can see the guys in shorts. So that's pretty much North Africa. So that would have been right in the beginning of the war. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was a great picture yes. of her. Um, so there were 33,000 women that served. And I think there was 13 million men that served. Mm -hmm. So there are very, very few women left who mm -hmm. served. Yeah. Well, I have somebody listening. Karen said her father is a World War II Marine Corps veteran. He served in Korea. He's alive and well at 96 years old. So it is estimated that there's about a million veterans left from World War II. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is Memorial Day, and uh, another statistic that's known is about 500 die every day. Oh. Um, so, uh, and this is Memorial Day. I, I always want to point out, it's about the, the veterans who have passed. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's how this all started. I think, Elsie, you saw my Facebook post today where I listed the nine veterans who since I did the book and it was published, uh, have passed. Yeah. Well, you actually captured like the soul of those veterans. So I asked you earlier, you know, as a photojournalist, like what was your method of getting them? They did not look posed. They looked very natural. And there was an intensity about their photo, you know, again, almost like you were looking into their soul. Well, the, the technique I always used is one of, you know, get people used to the camera that they're going to be getting their picture taken. So as soon as I get there, I pull it out, put it around my neck or over my shoulder. And when we get to the, the actual portrait session, I go out of my way to put them at ease just by continuing to talk to them and never once saying the word pose. Here's how I'd like you to pose. I don't bring it up because I don't want them to pose. Uh, we might be talking and they might go into a certain, you know, emotion and I'm just there with my camera. So a lot of those portraits as, of course, they're just, you know, a moment in time, they're static, but it was, their look was because of something we were talking about. In the book, there's probably three or four people who have big, giant laughs on their face. That's mm -hmm. because they were telling me, you know, one of those humorous stories from, from war, which happened. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I didn't say laugh <laughs> to them. <laughs> uh, so that's the technique. Just let them do what they're going to do in front of the camera. But, you know, I... I tell them all they've got to do, the only thing they need to do is, can you see this camera? Look in here. <laughs> Just look in the lens, and you're going to be looking at all the people out there who are going to see your picture, and they're going to read your words. So to, st to stare at them. <laughs> Well, you certainly captured them in their essence. Now, there was an event in your life, a traumatic event, which led you into this whole field. Tell us about that. Well, I went to Kent State University, and I was a biology major. And in 1970, in May, May 4th, 1970, the shootings at Kent State happened. And I was there, I was in the crowd, and it had been a, uh, a four-day-long 
act of civil disobedience, I have to say, which escalated to the shooting. And I was there and I ran. Uh, the U.S. Army shot at me. They shot it at the crowd. And we all ran and I ran and I wasn't I wasn't hit. But I guess I reevaluated my major and I switched over to photojournalism because I, w I wanted to cover the news. I wanted to be where things happened. And that's what happened. That's I, I made that change and it worked. My you were there, so your perception of what happened was very different than what you began reading, what the politicians were saying. You know, yes, and that was troubling. That was very troubling because, you know, it had been going on for some years, the Vietnam and the country was divided about the war. I never believed for a second that they were divided about the veterans, the people who actually served. I mean, my roommate at that time was a, a, a Vietnam veteran. You know, he'd gone there, done his duty. I can assure you that he thought it was nuts too. I mean, he was on the side of we shouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. But he did his, his duty. The Kent State was, that was civil disobedience. That was, uh, you know, against the war, the war, you know, in a philosophical sense. Uh, and it was, sure, uh, it was a protest against the, the, the government that was in place and their policies, not against veterans or military people. Mm -hmm. but, um, so when the politicians afterwards, you know, uh, the governor of Ohio actually uttered a phrase that, the students got what they deserved. Hmm. This is the governor of Ohio. And I'm thinking, you mean the, pe the penalty is you don't get a trial and you get executed. That's the penalty for civil, civil disobedience. What country are we in? So yeah, it was a crazy time. Almost as crazy as now. <laughs> yes, equally as crazy as now. And so that changed the entire course of your life and your work. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I mean, I, I'm, I wasn't a crusader for justice or truth, but I thought, um, you know, I saw what happened and I saw how politicians reacted and how the public reacted because the press has to report what the, what the governor of Ohio says. It's going to be in a headline. Mm -hmm. um, the, public, the public also had a real negative uh, reaction to this as far as the students got what they deserved, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to, I wanted to get inside of that somehow. Uh, find out how, why people think that way. And being a journalist for uh, 20 years, um, or for newspapers for 20 years, you, you see a lot of stuff. You really learn a lot about people. And, uh, you know, I'm glad I, I made the switch. Yeah. Well, it's very clear that all those veterans are also glad because you did a great job. And I'm going to post the link if you order your book from Richard's website. He'll send you a signed autograph copy. And have you thought about any other books of this nature, Richard? Well, <clears throat> I'm from the Vietnam era. and. Uh, I may do something similar to this with the Vietnam vets. I have thought about it. Mm -hmm. It's something I'll have to talk over with my publisher. Uh, my book's traditionally published. It's not self-published. Um, I couldn't afford to do that. Um, so I'm hoping this book does well, and maybe my publisher will sign me up for another, another book, Vietnam. Yeah. 
Well, on this Memorial Day, thank you for sharing so much about how this book came together and how you wound up as a photojournalist and began a whole different career. So if you were a biology major, you might have been thinking about being a doctor. Was that true? I was. I was thinking about actually being a dentist. Uh huh. Um, but I forgot all about that once by the time May 5th rolled around. I already had friends who were photographers and were enrolled in the journalism program at Kent. They have a very good journalism school. And they said, you should make the switch. If you're, if you're interested in this, you should do what you want to do. And that, that really uh, resonated with me because I felt like that's what I really wanted to do. That's another piece of advice I give to everybody. Just do the thing you love, not what you think you're supposed to do. So you followed your heart or followed your bliss, as Joseph Campbell would say. Yeah. 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 So let's yeah. Uh, put the cover back up for us again, Richard. The Last Veterans of World War II, black and white photo journal and stories about these men and women, just great. So I have a couple seconds to shout out one more veteran who we lost this year? Oh, okay, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Governor Brendan Byrne of New Jersey. <clears throat> okay. I'm in New Jersey, I live in New Jersey. I remember Brendan Byrne when yeah. I worked, worked at the newspaper. He was a great guy. I think he's well thought of. Uh, He's one of the best New Jersey governors. I think uh, Republicans and Democrats alike uh, would say that Brendan Byrne was a good governor. And uh, I just wanted to show this picture because I had a soft spot in my heart for Governor Byrne, and I'm glad he's in the book. I am too. Well, thanks so much for taking time out today. This is our second role, and it's come to the end beautifully, had no disruptions. So I want to thank everybody, Kathleen, thanks for joining us, and Karen for just talk, telling us about your dad, who's also a veteran at 96 and um, doing well. And we'll be back again with hopefully that book about the Vietnam vets. Thanks, Elsie. Thanks, good to see you. Take care, everybody, and happy Memorial Day honoring. We just want to take a chance, Richard, want to take a chance to honor those veterans on this special day.